So uh, first I would like to um, acknowledge and introduce Dr. Faiq Isa. Um, uh, Dr. Isa was born uh, in Basra and completed his medical degree at uh, Basra Medical College in 1974. Uh, he then migrated to Australia. He completed his PhD at Sydney University in 1984 and was a member of the team that invented continuous positive airway pressure, the CPAP, that uh, uh, we probably all know that we use for treatment of sleep apnea. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Dr. Isa will uh, tell us about this invention. Well, I arrived here in 1979 on a scholarship from the government of Iraq, uh, probably the first Iraqi who is given a scholarship to Australia. I had uh, lots of problems convincing the authorities that Australia is a good country for science and for medicine. I arrived here, uh, virtually there were only about 50 families, Iraqis, in Sydney, and there was only one uh, medical doctor who had arrived in the late 60s, and she was uh, practicing uh, medicine here. She arrived at the time when uh, there were no exams and there was no Medicare. But when I arrived here, things have changed in 1975. They have introduced Medicare and all the restriction on foreign medical doctors. Uh, I started uh, at Sydney University, as I said, I've already organized uh, doing a PhD with the University of Sydney at Department of Medicine. This was at the thoracic medicine. Uh, the plan was, uh, as you know, in the medical uh, colleges in Iraq, it's a six-year program like the British system, and the first three years is basic science, and most Iraqi uh, medical uh, schools, uh, there were deficiencies in the basic science uh, uh, professors. And the plan was to send Iraqi doctors to specialize uh, in this field and come back to uh, go back to Iraq and do uh, become uh, staff of the medical schools. Uh, I am going to uh, talk in, in this uh, 20 minutes uh, history of 20 years of work at uh, Sydney University and Royal Prince Alfred Hospital here in Sydney. Uh, we started uh, working in sleep apnea at the time when uh, nothing was known about uh, control of breathing and sleep and how we breathe during sleep. In fact, the sleep was only added to the agenda of medicine in 1953 when the electroencephalogram was recorded for the first time. And in the late 60s, one Italian professor uh, working in Sicily uh, one of the nurses uh, uh, noticed that the patient was hardly breathing during sleep. He will take a few breaths and then stop breathing. And it was a dilemma for the doctors then. This patient was in, complete, uh, in a respiratory failure that could not be explained by any of the uh, tests that they could do. And it was then... Uh, the link between breathing and what happens in sleep in, ter in terms of breathing and what happens during daytime. And sleep apnea uh, in uh, mid-70s started to be defined thanks to the advancements in medical technology. Medical technology allowed to record breathing and record sleeping in the simplest form in about mid-70s. I arrived, as I said, in 1979, and there was uh, one assistant professor at that time at the Department of Thoracic Medicine, uh, he, uh, Colin Sullivan, and he had just come back from Toronto. He has done two years postdoctoral uh, fellowship with another professor of uh, respiratory 
uh, a pulmonologist and a respiratory physiologist. And Colin and I, uh, I was his first PhD student, and we worked in the in the sleep uh, sleep apnea. Colin had done his PhD in the Department of Physiology at Sydney University with Professor David Reed, who was a pioneer uh, investigator of SIDS, Southern Infant Death Syndrome. And David Reed had bought some equipment to record babies during sleep. And we were able to use that uh, equipment to start our first work in sleep apnea. Uh, how I changed, uh, how I uh, wanted to do research, this is uh, a photo. I will show lots of uh, photos from the photo album that I have. Uh, this is year four in medical school in Basra. And this is uh, Dr. Joseph Maro. I think he's dead by now. And uh, he tickled our mind about medical research. You don't hear the first heart sound, you don't hear the second heart sound, but you ask why do we hear it and why when we put the stethoscope here, we hear the sound much better. And how many of the symptoms and many of the treatments, you ask a question of why and where and what is the alternative. So that instigated some uh, spirit in asking questions. So here, I arrived here, and of course there are lots of challenges. As I said, you're here by yourself, no other doctors, no other uh, people to speak at least your own language. And uh, embarking straight away, no six months of language, I, luckily I was my language was considered to be good, so I enrolled straight away at Sydney University. We had to do medical research. The number one thing was the difference between the Iraqi market and the Australian market in terms of every little thing uh, in life and in medical research. Uh, you need to know what's in, on the shelves in the market. Now, that was number one challenge, and I'll show you a few things in the, in the next few slides. And then how do you trans, uh, the transition from uh, a clinician to a, a clinical researcher? You have to stop thinking of treating all the patients who come to you and, and zoom into one particular disease. And then, of course, we had the I faced is the technology. Although I have worked in the medical city and I worked in the ICU, and we had sophisticated equipment in 1975, <coughs> But this equipment, if anything, wrong, if anything wrong goes with this equipment, we have the uh, maintenance department, we call the technician, and the equipment is taken out and replaced with another one, or it becomes vacant until it is repaired. And then I, when I worked at the medical school, we had uh, uh, also a very sophisticated lung function test, it just been imported from Germany, and we had to learn how to use it. And I remember in this particular device, a little fuse, uh, until we discovered it was a fuse, we had to wait for three months for a technician to come from Germany via Saudi Arabia, then to come to Basra to fix it. But here you are in a sleep lab, and I'm left alone. I have to learn all these equipment and all these wires and where they go, and which, equip, uh, which uh, button to press if anything goes wrong. So it was a, a very steep learning curve to know all this technology. And after a few days, a uh, few nights of uh, doing sleep studies, uh, this is our work, I was doing all work at night, we had to learn all these, uh, all these uh, little knobs and produce a record, a record that is valuable to diagnose the case. Another thing is that the technology wasn't as it is today. I want to take you to 1979 where the equipment were rudimentary compared to what it is. This is an ear oximeter. Uh, we bought this for $11,000 at the time, and it was considered to be big technology. Now you buy a simple finger oximeter, it costs about $50. So the professor was always with an Iraqi uh, PhD student with him, be careful, don't touch this, this. <laughs> so uh, technology-wise, it was difficult. Uh, to start, 
and continue the medical research, you have to make sure that all the equipments are functional. So I take you back to 1975 to 78, and this is at the time when I started, this is what we knew about sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is basically, you go, it's a hidden disease. A uh, patient is asleep alone, uh, doesn't know what's happening uh, because he's asleep. And if there is a bed partner, then the bed partner, is, if the, usually the patient is male, this was considered socially to be acceptable. Who is the man who doesn't snore? In fact, the theory said that men started snoring once they, when they lived in caves to scare the lions and the other wild animals. So here we are, we have an obstructive apnea where the patient takes a few breaths and then his upper airway closes. That's the upper airway means the soft palate, the tongue and the hypopharynx, they close. And then the oxygen saturation will go down and that will wake up the brain to say, take a few breaths. Takes a few breaths and the urge of sleep is very high and during the night and then he'll go to sleep again and go into apnea again. And this, will ca this can continue the whole night and it gets worse in some parts of sleep because our sleep cycle is not uniform. We go through what we call non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. And uh, the, the severity of sleep apnea in the first few uh, months that we started was unbelievable. Uh, I've seen patients with oxygen saturation goes to 20, which is with the PaO2 of close to zero, it's incompatible with life. But this is what we learned about sleep apnea, how severe it can be. So then, with the common treatment at that time was, as you always expect from the surgeon, and excuse me, for they bypass the problem and do a tracheostomy. That was the, the treatment at that time. A tracheostomy here, open in the neck. During the, day, the daytime, you put a plug, and patient can talk, and during the night, take the plug so that he breathes and bypass the area. There were other treatments like tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, but that was mainly for children. And there was some medication treatment, this protriptyline, which is an antidepressant. It basically affects the sleep cycle, so the patient is deprived of certain sleep cycle and avoid the worst part of the night for, with regard to the control of breathing. So how did we start thinking about sleep apnea? So there was tracheostomy, there were lots of fat people who had the sleep apnea, short, thick neck, and when you do tracheostomy, most of them will come with chronic infection and the tracheostomy tube had to be closed. And when it's closed, then there is no other treatment. So we had a team, uh, it was, the building was a, like a quarter of this room here, and in it was all the staff of the Department of Thoracic Medicine. It's a social life, very simple, completely different to the way I used to, pro to work in, uh, in Basra. Uh, the, th the Department of Thoracic Medicine was, the head was Anne Wilcox, she was a world-renowned uh, asthma specialist. She died in the uh, late 90s, uh, 1990. And then Colin Sullivan, as I said, he had just come back from Toronto. And Ivan Young was a high-altitude physiologist. Peter Bai was a restrictive young, a young pulmonologist. And we have David Reed. He, as I said, he was a renowned scientist in the respiratory uh, control. And he was working in SIDS. Another PhD student of his has become a neonatologist. He was working also in SIDS. Uh, and then uh, we have one respiratory phys uh, physician. He started his MD degree here uh, at the time I started. And Michael Burton Jones came about three, four months later and joined our group. And so we will meet all together in the, uh, in the department, have coffee together, have tea together, and we will talk about each one's interest. And we had um, uh, another scientist from, from the UK. He was Roger Altonian. Roger Altonian was the inventor of Intel. 
And uh, he was very much interested in nasal allergy at that time. And being from Syria, he and I, we started talking uh, a little bit about the Arabic world. And Kwok Yan was also looking at the relationship between nasal allergy, uh, hay fever, and asthma. <coughs> so there was a lot of talk about the upper airway. If you remember also in the textbooks of medicine and anatomy, when they talk about the respiratory system in the old days, the respiratory system ended from here. And there's no upper airway in any picture of Gray's anatomy or, or uh, other books. So this was a new area to tackle. Uh, so the, the theory of sleep apnea and talking, as I said, among the group about the importance of the nose and the upper airway, the theory was very simple. Push some air into the nose while the patient is asleep so that uh, this airway here, once you push through the nose, it pushes these structures that close, otherwise close in, a normal per in, uh, in the patient during sleep and uh, open, keep the airway patent. The challenge was how do you do it and keep the patient asleep? That was the challenge. So, uh, you are minutes. doing some work in, in, in a territory that no one has been uh, done any work, and you, so we decided to use the CPAP. So, the CPAP is uh, pushing air through the nose, but this air is pressurized, so there is a problem. Maybe the lung will rupture, maybe uh, it's too much pressure around the heart, so the patient will have cardiac complications. Uh, with high pressure going through the nasal mucosa, you might get bleeding, all kinds of problems that uh, uh, we thought could be happening. Uh, so it was a very careful research. As I said, uh, ethics review, there was no ethics review at that time to, to approve this, uh, this treatment. So this is the first CPAP machine that we used. And as I said, you have to know what's in the market. Is, there was no bunning at that time, so you have to go to Mitre 10 and the likes, little shops, and find something that will help you create uh, the instrument to uh, apply that high pressure, uh, the continuous pressure. So this, this tube is you all bought from Mitre 10. Uh, this, is, uh, this is called a conduit. This is used to... Uh, uh, here they put electric wires through them. Uh, the headband uh, we manufactured ourselves. And uh, the conduit here, you, uh, uh, you drill. Oh, this, is, this is all done in, in the department in our little workshop. And you put all these together, and then you pour some silicon. Now, th to find this, the right silicon, we have to consult with a few uh, dentists and a few plastic surgeons until we found Dow Corning uh, was the best. Uh, uh, this is me sleeping also doing some research on the upper airway. Uh, this is, you'll say, who's the crazy guy who's going to sleep with this? Well, we had the, the sickest of the sickest sleep apnea. These are the, f the first patient I showed you that first slide. He was an executive with companies in Singapore, he will fall asleep during the uh, board meeting. Uh, I'll show you a few slides of other patients. So we did this in the first five patients, and we decided to write this to Lancet, and uh, the editor immediately accepted the paper. Without any reviewers, he said, I'm very happy with this, and definitely work. You don't have to prove to me in 200 patients that this treatment works. And the treatment did work. He just, I'll show you what we used. Basically, it was a reverse uh, vacuum cleaner. So you get the output of the vacuum cleaner, not the suction side, and you attach it to the tube, and that tube, and you control the outer flow, and that air, the patient breathes in and goes uh, with it the amount of pressure it needs to open the airway. And once the airway is open, we were very scared when we, the first, the first time you apply sleep, uh, CPAP, they go into two to three hours of REM sleep. REM sleep is we suppose only to have 10 minutes to 20 minutes. So, and the body is completely switched off from the brain. 
the brain let the, the, the brain is doing some other computing functions, and we weren't sure if this is good or not. And it proved to be the best thing the patient can have after the treatment is a very long rem rest, rest, uh, restoration of what it has been missing. Slowly we, we modified the, the blower and we started using this mainly because of safety in case... One minute, Jennifer. Uh, mainly because if, it, if the motor burns, uh, it will not, uh, the gases will not go into the lung. So slowly we modified the mask. We started making the fiberglass mask. We take impression of the nose and then we make the mask here. And then that's what the patient took home. When we, uh, when we had about 50 patients, we wrote this, uh, published this paper. Now this paper, and then we moved into central sleep apnea. And the last thing is, we, uh, is the invention of the bubble mask. The bubble mask is the pressure by itself. Uh, this uh, soft part of the, of the mask will stick to the nose and the patient can sleep. The treatment was taken by the, the, uh, the European, the Canadian, but not the Americans. The Americans felt a little bit jealous. How can the Australians think of it? And we didn't think of it. So they called for a conference in Bethesda in 1986 and asked Colin Sullivan to go, but he couldn't go, so I went instead. And I sat with the uh, top people in the, uh, in the field discussing whether the Department of Health uh, should invest money into the field. And when, we presented, when I presented the data that we have about 100 patients by that time on home treatment, <coughs> They immediately approved funding uh, for sleep apnea, and the field grew since then. Uh, so much so in Australia, there was no item number in Medicare. In 1990, Medical Gazette secured an item number for sleep studies, and by that time, there were a few manufacturers of, sleep, of CPAP uh, in America and in Europe and here in Australia. Uh, they started the uh, sleep labs in 1990, and this graph shows how exponentially the number of sleep studies have uh, been done. And I will close this here just to show what we started as a very small adventure. Nowadays, it's worth $10 billion industry. Thank you, Dr. Isa. That was uh, uh, astonishing, really. Uh, great talk, and uh, uh, we live the journey with you, so thank you. Uh, can I call for Dr. Banuti to present uh, Dr. Isa with uh, an appreciation plug of his contribution to the um, uh, health um, of a human being in general? A, a high-achieving Iraqi. Thank you.